Um, so, yeah, first uh, I'll start by lowering your expectations a little bit. <laughs> uh, I just came back from America where I was at an interesting conference. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So I have a bit of jet lag. Um, if, I, if anything's incoherent that sounds like it might be interesting, but you can't understand it, um, just ask me later or, or shout at me. Uh, I'll be here all day. I'm happy to uh, talk to you and uh, help you guys if I can. And so I'll just start by talking a little bit about uh, this company, Shift Devices. I'm a co-founder of it. Uh, we are a Swiss-based company. We've been around for about two years now. Um, we're a spin-off of the university in Switzerland. Uh, this product, um, as Chris mentioned, was uh, I invented it. Uh, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about this in, in some technical detail. It sounds like the audience is quite, quite technical. Um, if there is something, some basic thing, don't be shy. Feel free to, free to ask, interrupt me. Um, in our company, we have the expertise in-house to, to do the hardware, also the software, and we have a lot of blockchain experience, and we're strong believers in, in making open source code, which is important for security. Um, so this talk is about best practices to secure your coin. Um, uh, this is just an overview of the talk. So what exactly needs to be kept safe? That might be obvious to a lot of you, but to, to newcomers, it's not. Um, how much should you be concerned? Uh, how are people keeping safe now? And then I'll give an example of uh, our product that we made to address this uh, in what we say, you know, some marketing now, what we think is a, a, the best way to keep your coin safe. So let's start with Bitcoin um, as an example. It can apply to any cryptocurrency. Uh, a common saying you hear a lot, uh, especially in the, er in the earlier times, is you can be your own bank with Bitcoin, uh, which is, sounds great. It's very attractive. What that means, though, is you also have to be your own security staff and uh, security vault also, which can oftentimes be intimidating, stressful, uh, complicated. Um, so what, what is it exactly that we need to keep secure? What is a Bitcoin? Um, this is an example, well, a Bitcoin is basically something digital that holds value. And this is uh, what something digital that holds value looks like. This is a Bitcoin uh, private key. And it's very important to keep this thing safe. Um, how to be safe? Uh, there's a couple of different methods. I'll go through them in more detail. Uh, online wallets, for example, just trust someone else to, to do the safety for you. Uh, software wallets, where you have uh, an app on your computer or your mobile phone. Uh, cold storage paper wallets, I'll get into that also. And then uh, finally, hardware wallets, which uh, we're, we're just one company. There's a couple others, uh, but this seems to be the accepted way to have the safest uh, security. So starting with exchanges and online wallets, uh, a lot of you are probably already familiar with this. Um, there's a long history of online exchanges getting hacked. Um, the biggest, of course, was Mt. Gox a few years ago, or $460 million at the time, I believe, uh, was lost. And it continues. Uh, last year, uh, there's a hack of $72 million from Bitfenix, $5 million here, $5 million there, and so on and so on. And probably a lot of hacks you haven't even heard about because the company doesn't want to tell you. Um, so the key point with the last slide is that uh, whoever owns this uh, String, this private key, owns the Bitcoins. Um, it's just a general message. So if you have coins on exchange, it's really an IOU um, for them to give you coins back in the future. So alternatively, you can keep this yourself. There's a lot of software apps, mobile apps that do this. Um, and I'll, I'll go into a bit detail about why, why this is dangerous. Uh, this is just one example. It's not exactly targeting Bitcoin, but it could. Um, as you may know, this is ransomware. Uh, where it encrypts the files on your computer and then asks for Bitcoin as a, a ransom in order to unlock your files. And this shut down the UK health system for a few days. Um, more sophisticated versions of it came out later, shutting down multinational companies around the world. And more sophisticated attacks are coming out more and more. And to be honest, this is uh, a bit amateurish software. It's, it's really not that complicated. Um, yet it worked. And what it could have done instead, for example, is not tell you anything. Um, still get into your computer and then look for these valuable strings of data, which could be Bitcoins, it could be other coins, um, and so on and so on. And not tell you anything and just take it. Um, 
I mentioned I was in the US recently. I was on a panel at the National Cyber Symposium. Um, not exactly Bitcoin specific, but just cybersecurity in general. And there's a lot of interesting things, uh, just to go off on a tangent, uh, I'd like to share. Um, this symposium uh, was mainly by the uh, local government and military. And so it was very interesting to hear their perspectives on where cybersecurity stands these days. And the basic take home message is that uh, we're all basically screwed. <laughs> we're all hacked. So the, the keynote speaker was the former head of the CIA, uh, General Petrus, if I pronounce his name right. Um, he's self-described chief of breaking and entry, which is interesting. One of the things he said was there's two types of people in the world, uh, those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. Uh, he was later corrected by a couple of other people saying there's two types of people in the world, those that know they've been hacked and those that don't know they've been hacked. Um, uh, some interesting little side notes. Uh, uh, or I, I guess one of the, one of the, um, the big issues with cybersecurity and why um, we're basically screwed is that um, there's more sophisticated attacks happening. It's becoming easier to make these attacks. Um, in order to defend these attacks, you have to defend the whole surface area. Uh, so that becomes more and more complicated, more and more tricky, more and more costly. Whereas the attacks to uh, attack you, they, they don't need to attack the whole surface area. They just need to find one, one vulnerability. So it's becoming cheaper and easier to do attacks. And this just isn't a scalable situation. So something needs to change. Um, currently, uh, a lot of people in the US say that cybersecurity is the biggest uh, threat. Um, in the next uh, years. Uh, in fact, um, they say the biggest war in history is actually taking place right now, and it's a cybersecurity war uh, between different nation states. Um, the US has officially recognized the cyberspace as a field of battle that joins the air, uh, sea, and land as the other fields. Uh, they have a dedicated command and control center, and there's hundreds of thousands of people fighting this war, which is interesting. Um, the, so you may not think that affects you, but these tools end up spreading down the food chain to other people. For example, uh, the CIA itself was hacked. So if you think you can't be hacked, um, if the CIA can be hacked, then probably all of us can also. Uh, it's called the Vault 7. You can research it. Um, basically, the CIA lost all of their uh, hacking tools, and these are available to buy on the dark net. And these tools attack every type of operating system, every type of mobile phone, every type of IoT device. For example, um, one of the published ones was Samsung TVs, smart TVs. Uh, they could turn on the, the microphone and record your conversations. Um, it's not only nation states. Uh, it's interesting that crime is becoming more and more organized. Uh, one of the other interesting uh, little points was that nation states actually lease out cybercrime um, groups to do some of the attacks for them, in part to hide the trail of who's doing the attack. And it's becoming more and more professionalized. And you can uh, rent out these attacks uh, yourself to do, for example, uh, pay for DDoS attacks. Um, and it's becoming easier and easier. Some of you may be familiar with Kali Linux. It's uh, an a different version of the Linux operating system specifically targeted for um, penetration testing. So it's created with the good in mind to help you penetrate test, but of course, anyone can go and take this and then do the penetration testing on you yourself um, and get access to things. So these, I have all of these here just as uh, uh, cases to show that um, storing uh, Bitcoins, these things on your computer or on your mobile phone. Maybe it's okay today, but in the future as these attacks are growing exponentially and as the Bitcoin value, the cryptocurrency value is also growing exponentially, uh, it's gonna become a bigger, bigger target. And there's gonna be more and more attacks. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I will say part of my job as a company selling security devices is to instill paranoia in the market. <laughs> but I, I do think uh, from many people that uh, it is something we need to think about and be prepared for. Um, so what's, what's a good way to do it? Uh, before hardware wallets came around, it was paper wallets and cold storage. You can see a couple of examples here. And uh, the general idea is you take these keys and you never let them touch the, the internet. 
Uh, these are very safe. Uh, the issue comes when you try to spend uh, coins from a paper wallet. Uh, it means you have to load it up into uh, an app on your computer again, and at that point it can be vulnerable. So hardware wallets, uh, moving along. Um, they're basically, to put them very simply, it's taking cold storage and making it very simple. Um, and uh, I'll go into a bit detail example of our hardware wallet. Um, looks like this. You can hold it on a keychain. And again, the idea is very simple. Uh, the idea is you don't want these secrets to be exposed to your computer, to the internet. So what you do is you generate the secrets on the device itself with the hardware random number generator, and you never let the secrets touch the internet. Um, and so each of these points I'll go over in a bit more detail. Um, just to the, describe, we're describing our product, but it applies uh, to basically any hardware wallet. Uh, I'm going to go into the technical details just to give you an idea of um, uh, why it would be considered safer. So our device, it has a USB interface. Uh, it's password protected, uh, which means if someone steals the device itself, uh, they only get uh, 15 tries to try to break into it uh, before it erases itself. So it's protect that protects against brute force password attacks on the device. All the communication is encrypted, and it's plug and play. So we try to make it as simple as possible. Yeah, plug, and then uh, play. So uh, it has a touch button and backlit LED for user confirmation. So that's to prevent remote access. You actually have to be physically present and touch the button. If we break it open and look, in, look at the guts a little bit, uh, you can see the touch button there. It's a capacitive touch button. There's an SD card. So uh, you need the secrets to be kept offline. That's equally important for backup and recovery. Um, if you lose the device, you want a way to recover your coins, but that recovery process should also not touch the uh, internet. And so we, we, our approach, uh, kind of unique for us, is we use a micro SD. And this vastly simplifies the approach. It's um, basically mindless. Uh, uh, when you initialize the wallet, it creates a backup on the SD card for you. And then the idea is you take that SD card out. You don't need it for normal operation. You put it somewhere safe. And if you have a lot of coins, maybe make a couple different backups and put them in different safe locations. Uh, there's a single purpose microcontroller. So this is a, it really is a mini computer. Um, one of the advantages, or compared to, another advantage compared to um, operating systems, software on operating systems, is there's a much lower attack vector. So if you look at the lines of codes in common operating systems, uh, you know, it's in the tens of millions. And so it's basically impossible to fully audit those codes to eliminate all backdoors. Whereas with, um, uh, hardware wallets, you have about 20,000 lines of codes, which makes it a lot easier uh, to audit. Single purpose microcontroller. We, another unique thing about us is we do a dual chip approach. The second chip is for storing secrets. It's a high security chip. Um, high security just means it's really difficult to physically extract the keys. There's some techniques to basically decap a microcontroller and use a a very good microscope to read the bits actually on the microcontroller itself. And this chip uh, is physically designed to prevent that from happening. Or you, you, you can never fully say prevent, but to make it very difficult. And what very difficult means is it'll take a very long time, years, decades, uh, and a lot of money in the millions of dollars to actually access these secrets. And it has a harder random number generator to create the secrets. So speaking of random numbers, um, Randomness is extremely important in the cryptocurrency field. Uh, random numbers are used to create unique wallets. And so you have to be very, you have to pay a lot of attention to um, what the source of randomness is. In our case, we have a hard onboard hardware random number generator. It meets a, a lot of specifications for guaranteed randomness. However, um, in Bitcoin especially, it's good to have a, a lot of paranoia. So if you don't trust that, uh, which maybe we don't. Uh, we add, during the factory install, extra randomness, and we cryptographically combine with the output of the random number generator. Uh, if you don't trust us also, we also add randomness from you in the form of um, the password you enter to use the device. And so that's, 
something we can't predict, and that's uh, added to the cryptographically added to the entropy also. Um, it's uh, important to be able to verify that what you're signing with the device uh, is actually what you think it is. And so we do that through a mobile app. Um, others have a screen on board their device. We'll have that in future versions also. But right now we use a, a mobile app. Uh, we call it smart verification. It basically means that the mo we securely connect the mobile app to the device um, so that there's an encrypted communication between the device itself that bypasses the computer. And the mobile app is, serves as basically a secure remote screen so you can see what you're signing. And we have an optional second factor authentication. What that means simply is uh, you could make a check mark and then the mobile phone also becomes a secure remote button. So you need to touch the button on the device itself and you need to touch the uh, button on the mobile app. Um, we also have a simple to use cross-platform native desktop app. It works in uh, three main operating systems, Mac, uh, Windows, and Linux. And um, yeah, we try to make it as simple as possible. We're in the stage right now of um, uh, redoing the whole desktop app to make it uh, more simple, but also to make it a lot easier to add support for uh, altcoins, um, Ethereum, Litecoin, and, and whatever else. Um, our current status is we've, we've been selling for over a year, a uh, year and a half. Uh, we have satisfied customers in 70 plus countries. Um, I know we have a few customers here, so if you're not satisfied, I'd be very happy to hear from you. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we get good feedback. And so it's, it, right now we support Bitcoin, uh, Ether, and it's also um, U2F, which is a second factor authentication device, which is a, 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 a protocol that's very good. It's growing in popularity. Uh, you can use it to uh, log into Gmail, Dropbox, Facebook, uh, GitHub, and so on as a second factor. Um, yeah, so it's, um, Bitcoin is a start, cryptocurrencies are a start, um, but we think long term, say five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, we think everyone's gonna need um, a key like this in their pocket, uh, not only for storing their digital value, but for other things. For example, governments want to put uh, you on the internet, also in the forms of electronic identification. Um, yourself, that might be something even more valuable than money. Uh, and other things, even simpler things like logging into bank accounts or logging into websites. Um, and so we, we think uh, just like you need a key to enter your apartment or start your car, um, as more and more value gets put online, it's possible you're gonna have even more valuable things digitally than what you actually have in your house or the value of your car. And so we think it's a natural evolution um, that people will really need a physical key, a separate physical key to do this, especially if you consider the slides I showed before um, with all the different ways that you can hack um, computers and mobile phones and the unscalability of defending against that. Um, and so these are just some examples. Um, right now we're focusing on the cryptocurrency wallet, but we have our mind also on the future for, for other applications. And with that, um, I'm happy to take questions and thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, the question was, uh, what are our plans for development for um, other coins in particular? So right now we are in the process of overhauling our um, desktop app. We're gonna basically writing it from scratch. Uh, it was written in C++, we're switching to the Go language. Um, and one of the goals is to uh, uh, make it a lot more intuitive, uh, but another goal is uh, under the hood to make it a lot easier to add support for, for different coins that we can plug and play. So uh, Ethereum will definitely be on it, Litecoin will definitely be on it. Um, we'd love to put Monero on it, it's a bit more complicated, um, and we're, we're quite open to hearing uh, opinions about other coins that should be added.
only a graph interface yeah. for Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we'll have uh, in the same desktop app, there will be graphical interfaces for these other coins. So what you're referring to right now is um, we, have, we support Ether, but it's through a, a MyEther wallet uh, integration, which is a third party. Yeah. Yeah. To be fair, that's the same with the Trezor, right? It doesn't support Ethereum natively. You have to plug it into MyEther wallet. I, I spoke to uh, Jackson Palmer. He does them reviews. And I asked him which is his uh, favorite hardware device. Is it Ledger or uh, Trezor? And he said uh, Digital Bitbox, just to let you know. Um, <laughs> Your um, 15 attempts and then deletes, that scares me because my memory is shit. <laughs> and uh, many a time have I put in 50 passwords and then got the right one. Yeah. So, I mean, if I've got one or two Bitcoin on the device and 15 scares me. <laughs> yeah, so um, 15 until it erases. Um, but then the idea is you have a backup on the micro SD card. So then you can um, load that up and then you if you have that backup, then you really get an infinite number of tries to recover. So really, the, the case here is, uh, for example, if you go to a pub and you leave your keys, which happen to have a digital bitbox on it, on the bar, and then someone grabs it and tries to, to access it. So that's really the attack scenario we're looking at. But as long as you have the, back, the backup, then you can, you can try. But yes, it's, um, it's important to remember your password. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, th this brings up a good point because uh, I think, I don't know if there's a good solution for this, but um, how do you deal with passwords? Uh, that, that could be the, I think that is the biggest cause for lost Bitcoin, uh, just in general, um, throughout the history. Um, so if someone smart can come up with a good way to um, solve that problem, that'd be a good thing. Just another quick question. I've not used the Bitbox, but um, can you sign transactions on SegWit? Uh, the Bitcoin. Uh, uh, not right now. This will be in the new desktop app. It will be, yeah. Yeah. Because uh, on um, <coughs> Trezors, you can't do it anymore. Can't do it anymore. Okay. So just to make it make sense to me, mm -hmm. um, the keys, the private key, never leaves the wallet, right? So do, how does how do you ex how do you sign the request? So I, I take it that your desktop dot, desktop app encrypts with your public key and pokes it, pokes a message at your, or sends a message to the hardware wallet, and then the hardware wallet sends it back encrypted with the private key. And if, if the app understands that and can decrypt it with the public key, it knows you've got it. Is that how it works? Um, uh, basically. So yeah, the question is, how, how is if the private key is always on the device, then how do you sign the transactions and, and get them published? Right. Um, so this is basically the. Um, um, it's easy to explain this in America. I don't. Do you guys use bank checks in England? No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Black. Yeah. Yeah. A check. A paper check. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's very similar to a paper check. So I guess you have to sign it in order for it to be valid, right? Handwritten signature. And so this handwritten signature is the same as what happens with the the key on this device. So you create this this check. You have an amount, you have a person you want to send it to. That's all public, that's OK. You create this, you send that into the device, and then the device itself adds a signature, and then it spits out the signature. It doesn't spit out the private key. It only spits out the signature. And then once you're at that point, you can't change it, and then you can, you can send it. And that signature is only valid for that set of inputs. So even if you, even if you snapped it, you can't do anything with it. <coughs> Any more questions? Oh, here we go, at the back. Mm -hmm. As cryptocurrencies become um, more and more part of people's standard investments, mm -hmm. um, there, will become, there will come a stage where people die, and how do you then pass on somebody's estate if they're mm -hmm. locked up in these devices? Have you had any thoughts on um, how estate management might be looked at in the future? Um, yeah, I mean... Uh we, we've thought about this, but we haven't really spent much much effort trying to implement it in in our, I guess, company ecosystem. Uh, but it's a very good point. Um, so, how would it work for for this case? I, I know what some people are doing is they'll put their their savings on one of these devices, uh, put it in a bank vault, and then put the password in a separate bank vault. 
Um, and then uh, you, when they pass away, then their um, descendants can have access to this. And so, uh, like all of cryptocurrency, it, it's a process to figure out what's the right language to use, uh, how to explain it simply. Um, and this is, uh, I would say it's an ongoing process. Yeah, can I add to that? So like, let's go back to the banking analogy. Yeah. You used the check a second ago. So that reminds me of kind of like a couple that has a joint bank, right? Because so, either of them can sign it. So if, if I got married to somebody, I could move my Bitcoin into a one of two multi-sig wallet, meaning just one key would be required to spend from it, right? Any one of those two, me or my wife's. So that means if one of us does die, the other one can you know, access that money, move it to a single key wallet, or just leave it there. Because then it essentially becomes a one of one key, because the other key has died with me, you know what I'm saying? So that's, that's one thing to do. Sorry, this, this lady was next. Um, my, my Bitcoin is stored on a, a, a Nano Ledger, mm -hmm. Ledger Nano. Um, what, should I be buying a digital Bitbox? <laughs> I didn't know about digital Bitbox. Um, yeah, if Joe heard that answer, uh, or question, I'd let him answer. But <laughs> um, so I, I think the the main the main feedback we get from um, uh, the market right now uh, with respect to the Ledger Nano is uh, simplicity. So it seems to be a lot easier to use our devices, in particular during um, uh, the initial setup and also the wallet creation. So if you have a Ledger Nano, you had to go through the the setup phase with um, writing down these mnemonic words. 24 words or whatever, and then you have to re-enter them. Uh, I, I, how long did that take you? Probably because I was very slow, about 20 minutes. 20 minutes, yeah. No, it, it takes me about 20 minutes also. So with our device, that'll take less than a second, and you don't have to think about it. Um, so it really takes away a lot of the, uh, the mental stress in, involved with that. Um, so that's what we have the, the SD card for. Uh, and so we think, especially, um, Today, I think a lot of people who are in, into cryptocurrencies are quite, quite technical. They can figure things out. Um, but if it becomes mass adoption, then the next wave of people are not going to be technically inclined. And so one of our goals is to make it as simple as possible to use. And part of that is making the, the backup and recovery process also as simple as possible. And then we have other technical uh, advantages also, if I could talk about that you later. You mean like one of my favorites, which is the plausible deniability feature. Yeah. So with the digital bitbox, if you enter the incorrect password, it will create a brand new wallet, right? So what that means is if, hypothetically speaking, you got stopped at an airport or somewhere where you didn't really want to reveal the balance in your wallet, you just put the wrong password in and it will open up just as if that was the real password, right? So until you enter the correct password, it doesn't open up the wallet that you usually use. So you just intentionally enter the wrong password in front of someone and it would open up just the same, but the balance would be zero. And it's a feature they built in. Yeah. Plausible deniability. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. Um, so the backup on the uh, micro SD card, it, can that only, can you copy that on a PC is, is one. And if um, digital Bitbox wasn't available, can you use that to restore on other devices or wallets? Uh, yeah, um, so we we save the file as a PDF actually, um, so you could even plug it directly into a, a printer. It should be a trusted printer, not a public printer, uh, and so you can print it out onto paper. Also, um, you can. Um, it's not a QR code. It's just a it's a string of uh, uh, like like I showed before, a string of characters, and then um, the other question was, what if we disappear? Um, so that's a very important question that uh, we think is crucial to also um, solve that problem. And so we have, um, um, we have a backup center. It's a, it's a website. You can download it and run it offline where you can put in, you can enter the, uh, the backup and your password and you can recreate um, all of the private keys. And then there's a, a simple way to take uh, that input and plug it into the Electrum software wallet, which is maybe the most popular uh, and safest, secure software wallet, uh, and then you can recover your coins inside of that. All right, cool. Quick plug for Joe. Joe, the organizer of this event, his company is Inspiring Co., and he has 50 of these digital bitboxes with him. So if you want to buy one, you can get a discount with one of these little coupons. So he's got a stack of them out there. 
Um, so this little QR code will send you to his website where you can make a payment, and then he'll give you it today. But he's only got 50 with him. So let's have a round of applause for Dr. Douglas. That was the biggest round of applause of the day. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Thank you. So we're going to have a quick break now. We're going to have Mr. Bitcoin back on, and then we're going to go to our headline speaker, Mr. Stephen Keane, Professor Stephen Keane. <laughs>